So good afternoon. <clears throat> this is lecture eight of the course entitled Using Vector Calculus to Solve Problems in Electricity and Magnetism. I'm Dr. Richardson. My email address is listed on this slide. So a couple of administrative issues. A uh, reminder that the learning is an active sport. You won't get anything out of this course by simply watching me write on a whiteboard. You need to take notes during throughout the lecture process them and review them. Again, the lectures are being videotaped and they'll be available on the Google Drive. Uh, this lecture will probably be available sometime early next week, probably Monday or Tuesday. There are problem sets for the course. If you don't do the problem sets, you're not gonna get anything out of this course. Let's see, problem set six, the solution key was posted in Google Drive last Tuesday. Problem set seven is a, a new problem set that was posted also on Tuesday. My email uh, questions on any course material at my email address above. Um, you'll need a ruler in working through the problems and taking notes. And um, let's get started. So this afternoon, we're going to look at the problem of the electrostatic potential. We're going to define it, and we're going to spend a great deal of time showing that it's a very useful idea to have to calculate electric fields in electrostatics. So let's review the idea of work, at least from the point of view of mechanics. So you know that work is force times a distance. So let's take a real physical system. So imagine a surface. So we're only gonna consider motion in one dimension. So on this surface, we'll put an object of some mass. And this mass can move back and forth in the x direction. But for the moment, it's stationary. And so what I will do is apply a force to this object. Forces are vector fields. So using this definition from elementary mechanics, I can write down an expression for the force on this object, the work on this object, the work that I do on this object is just force times the distance. But I'm going to be a little bit more careful. And I'm going to introduce the idea that I can write work in the form of a line integral, or path integral. And we've discussed line integrals or path integrals before in this course. So work is a scalar, and it's the line integral over some path of force dotted into dr. So it's very easy to see what's happening in this case, since this object can only be, is only constrained to move in one dimension. I can look at the case where the force and the displacement dr are parallel to each other. And it's very easy to calculate this line integral. Line integrals in general are complicated creatures, but in this case it's not. Because all I have to do is take the dot product of two vectors that are collinear. So I just have the product of two scalars. Furthermore, let's make our life a little bit more simpler. If the force is constant, it comes outside of the integral. And then all I have to do is integrate over uh, the differential in one dimension, and that's easy. So that's just going to be the distance which the object moves. So you can consider cases where between the object and the surface there's no friction. You can consider cases where there is friction, but the bottom line is that you're going to do work on this system by applying external force so that the object moves through some distance, okay? And that distance is delta r. 
Now, the reason, so why have I gone to the trouble of rewriting something that I knew from elementary physics in terms of a surface interval, which we're familiar with in this course using vector calculus? Well, there's a reason. The reason is suppose I pick a different problem. Namely, suppose I have the case where this force on this object is not in the positive i hat direction. Suppose, in fact, it's a vector force that looks like that. Well, not to worry. If I draw a line that's parallel to the surface, I can define an angle theta that that new force F makes with that dashed line. And now I'm still in business. It's no longer true that the force is perpendicular to the different to the uh, displacement, but that doesn't scare me as far as this line integral is concerned. I can still evaluate it using all the rules that we've discussed so far for dealing with line integrals. So what am I talking about? So the work done on that object in this case is going to be the a the magnitude of the vector f times displacement, which is a scalar, times the cosine of the angle theta, where I've defined theta in this diagram here. And so again, I mean, I can evaluate this thing. Assume that the force is constant. All I need to do is bring it outside of the integral. And I need a knowledge of theta. That's just going to give me a number. And then I can evaluate the line integral. So let's spend a minute talking about units here. So dr clearly is a displacement. It has to have units of meters. Force, if you go use some things you know from elementary physics, is a mass times an acceleration. So that has units of kilograms times meters per second squared. So dimensionally, the work must have units of kilograms meters squared divided by second squared. So we will define a set of units where a Newton is just a kilogram meter per second squared. So those are the units of force. And we will define a joule to have units of kilogram meter squared over second squared. So work has units of joules, but I'll point out something that we'll come back to next lecture. Joule is a suitable unit for energy. It's the same thing with energy. So what this dimensional analysis argument is suggesting is that work and energy are the same two creatures. And there's really no difference between the two of them. Okay, so that ends our review of work as far as mechanics is concerned. What about work in electrostatics? How can we take the same idea and apply it to electrostatics. OK. So formally, we can write things down. Work is a line integral. It's the line integral of the dot product of a force times a, whoops, displacement vector. Okay. Clearly, you can get the same result by just integrating over small amounts of work. 
differentials. So dW, which is a scalar, is just a force dotted into dr. And if I want to evaluate the work in the context of electrostatics, I'm going to need to know two things. I'm going to need to know a force, and I'm, need to, I'm going to need to know a displacement. So let's apply this to a very simple problem in electrostatics. So consider, if you will, a charge, point charge Q that's stationary. So this is a stationary point charge, it's fixed. I will also call this my source charge. And that's a convention we've used before. So this point charge generates an electric field. So somewhere over here, I'm going to have a test charge, which again, I use the same convention that we previously used. I'll call that Q prime, so I can distinguish that from Q. So if there were no, so I want to ask the following question. I want to ask the question, how much work do I have to do to move my test charge Q prime from a point A to a point B? So how much work is required to move my test charge Q prime from my point A to my point B in the presence of my source charge Q. So before we write any equations down, let's think about that for a moment. If there is no source charge, then the answer to this question is zero. There's no work required because there's no external field generated by Q. So let's put that charge back. So I can use all the machinery of classical mechanics to write down the answer to this question. I just have to be very careful about how I do it. So work, or in this case, differential work, small piece of work, is going to be a force dotted into a displacement. In the problem I just discussed, I have two point charges, a source charge Q and a test charge Q prime. So there's clearly a force between these two charges. And that force, I know exactly how to define in terms of Coulomb's law. But I want to move Q prime from a point A to a point B. So I want to fight this force. I want to apply a force that goes against this force due to Coulomb's law. So I will need a minus sign. And that's a force. Why? Again, that's a force, sorry. Because I want to do, I want to do work against my system, which is comprised of two charges, Q and Q prime. So dW is going to be minus Coulomb's law, which is Q, Q prime, R hat, dotted into dr, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, R squared. 
I know how to simplify this expression here because contained in this is in fact the definition of the electric field. The electric field is just a charge Q, in this case the source charge, divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, times R squared. So if I give these guys numbers, and this is lecture 8, then 8, 1 becomes 8, 2 for the example that we've picked in electrostatics of moving a charge, a test charge Q prime from a point A to a point B in the presence of a source charge Q. And all that reduces is to a nice simple expression for the amount of work DW done on the system. Now I'm not finished yet, right? Because I don't want DW I want work. So I'm going to have to do an integral. So the work done in moving my point charge Q prime from a point A to point B in the presence of my source charge Q is just going to be this integral, which is in fact minus Q prime, pull that outside of the integral, times the dot product of E with dr. And now I can put my limits of integration in because I'm moving my uh, charge, my um, test charge Q prime from a point A to a point B. So this is the work done in moving again Q prime from A to B in the presence of Q, my source charge. So I am going to define, I believe this is eight dash four. So I'm going to make my life a little simpler and define something, which I'll call V, so two parallel horizontal lines means is the definition. And this will be the work divided by Q prime, and that's just formally minus. Again, I need that minus sign because I'm doing work against Coulomb's law. I want to move that charge Q prime from one point to the another in the presence of Q. And I have to put in my limits of integration. So what is this guy V? It's the work done per unit charge. After all, it has units of work divided by charge. This thing will have a name. We will call V the, the electrostatic potential. Um, I should say most authors use V for the symbol for electrostatic potential. There are some authors who use the symbol phi, so it's just be aware of that. Okay. Okay, now there's a problem. The problem is I still have to do my integral between two limits of integration, A and B. So in fact, my electrostatic potential is going to have a value at V minus a value at A. 
and that's going to be obtained by doing this line integral of e dot dr. Because after all, if I use the laws of, of elementary integration, when I do this integral, it's a proper integral. It has two contributions from these two limits. So that's going to tell us something interesting immediately. If you ask the question, what is the electrical static potential I know what it is in terms of a definition. It's the work required to move a, a test charge Q prime from one point in space to another, or so it's work per unit charge. But that's really ill-defined. It's like asking how high is the Empire State Building in New York or how high is the Salesforce building in San Francisco? You really can't answer those questions unless you put in some reference. So you could ask the question, how high is the Empire State Building uh, measured using sea level as a reference? Or how high is the Empire State Building measured from the uh, concrete ground on which it sits? or how high is the Salesforce building in San Francisco with regard to the sidewalk. So you always will need some reference in evaluating this thing. So let's see how all this works and let's pick a nice example. And let's pick the simplest example that we know about in electrostatics. And that is a single point charge Q at the origin. So I know what the electric field is generated by that single point charge is Q divided by four pi epsilon naught R squared times our radial unit vector R hat. So in fact, I can calculate the electrostatic potential at a point B minus the electrostatic potential at a point A by just putting in the electric field in this case, which is that of a single isolated point charge at the origin. And then I have to dot that into a displacement vector, dr. Now this expression in the integrand looks complicated, but it's really not because my differential or my uh, displacement uh, vector dr, at least in spherical polar coordinates, I know what this is. We did this in problem set three. It's r hat dr plus r d theta times theta hat plus r sine theta d phi phi hat. If you take the dot product of r hat with the differential line element and spherical polar coordinates, that's going to simplify immensely. r hat dotted into dr is just going to be the magnitude of dr. So I'm ready to rock and roll. The electrostatic potential difference, if you will, is going to be an integral that's elementary. And it's just going to reduce to this q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. There's a dr there. And that's going to become Q over four pi epsilon naught R evaluated at one over R sub B minus R sub A, where 
R sub B and R sub A are just vectors from the origin to the points B and A respectively. So again, for my simple case of an isolated point charge, I have a electrostatic potential. You may ask, why do we call this thing a potential and does it have anything to do with potential energy? And we'll put those questions off to next lecture. But this is a difference. So all we're worried now is just defining this thing, being able to calculate it, and I will say in a few minutes why we should even worry about this. So to make some progress with handling this thing, I need to define some reference. It's going to be useful. Because after all, I can't ask, I cannot answer the question, how tall the, is the Empire State Building, unless you tell me I'm measuring its height with respect to its base. So in this example, I'm going to let R sub A be infinity. In that case, the electrostatic potential at point A is simply going to be zero, because the potential goes like one over a distance. And so when everything is said and done, the electrostatic potential for an isolated point charge that's located at the origin is just Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught R. Where, when I write this down, it's understood that our reference point is at infinity. That when R equals infinity, the electrostatic potential vanishes. Okay. So we have defined what we mean by work in electrostatics, and we've introduced something called the electrostatic potential that tells us the work per unit charge. And we've evaluated for the simple case of a isolated point charge. Okay, so all this is nice, but it's not particularly useful until you ask the following question. How, excuse me, are the electric field and the electrostatic potential related. I guess that assumes that they are. So let's just delve into that question. Well, let's start with our definition of the electrostatic potential. It's a scalar. It's minus the line integral of the electric field dotted into the displacement vector. Note that everything is fine with this expression. The left-hand side is a scalar. So the electrostatic potential is a scalar field or a scalar function. The right-hand side involves the electric field, which is a vector. The displacement vector, dr, is clearly a vector. You can take the dot product of those two guys to get a scalar. So all that hangs together, fine. Now, the electrostatic potential could be obtained by just adding up little pieces of the electrostatic potential, dv. So I'm in a position now to write down an expression for dV. It's just minus times the dot product of the electric field with the displacement vector. And I know what this is. This is minus E sub x dx minus E sub y dy minus E sub v dz. 
And remember, what I'm trying to do is find a nice connection between the electric field E and the electrostatic potential D. But remember that the electrostatic potential is a scalar field. It depends on how, where you are in space. So in this case, it has three components, x, y, and z. So multivariable calculus tells me that I could write down an expression for the total derivative of the electrostatic potential. It's just a partial derivative of v with respect to x dx plus the partial derivative of v with respect to y dy plus the partial derivative of v with respect to v dz. Um, realize that these partial derivatives mean that I'm holding fixed the other variables in this problem. But, you know, as I said before, when we talked about this a few lectures ago, you know, once you have functions of many variables, it gets cumbersome to keep these other fixed variables. And you know what you're doing by context. So I'm going to get rid of those. And so now I'm ready to answer my question. Equation star and equation double star, or equation asterisk and equation double asterisk, are related. And they tell you that E sub x is minus the partial derivative of B with respect to x. They tell you also that E sub y is minus the partial derivative of v with respect to y. And they also tell you that e sub z is minus the partial derivative of v with respect to z. So there must be a nice simple way to take everything here and write it in terms of one simple expression. And, there, and the answer is yes, there is. And we'll do that here. If we combine all of these important facts, I mean, we know what E sub X is, E sub Y is, and E sub Z is in terms of partial derivatives. We get a nice little beautiful formula or relationship. It says that the electric field is minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. Note that the electrostatic potential for an isolated point charge goes like one over R. The gradient operator also goes like one over R. So the product of those two things gives you something that should go like one over R squared. And on the left-hand side, I have an electric field, which I know goes like one over R squared. So everything is fine. So what have I discovered? If I can find the electrostatic potential for a problem, Z then all I have to do is take minus the gradient of it, and that'll give me the electric field. Calculating electrostatic potential, I claim is gonna be a lot easier than calculating the electric field. The electrostatic potential is after all a scalar field. The electrostatic potential is a vector field that has three components. Now we'll go through uh, at least four more examples of this today. Calculating a problem that has vector components that are, that are uh, uh, involves a vector that has three components is going to entail much more work than just calculating or solving a problem that just involves a scalar. 
So electrostatic potential is going to help you calculate electric fields in a much easier manner than by doing the problem uh, as we've done previously, by just calculating the electric field using Coulomb's law. All right, so let's go through some examples to see how this works. And in fact, we're going to pick examples we've seen before. So, first problem, I'm going to imagine two point charges, Q1 and Q2. They'll be separated by some distance. And that distance will be D. So the distance between Q1 and the origin and Q2 and the origin is D over two respectively. I'm going to call this point P. I'm going to define my coordinate system using these unit vectors. And here, the distance from the origin to P I'll call Z. The distance from Q1 to P I'll call R, which is identical to the distance between Q2 and P. And this is a right triangle. So what I want to do in this problem is find the electrostatic potential at point P. And for this particular example, I'm going to make my life a little easier and just say that these two charges are identical. Q2 and Q1 equal Q. So Coulomb's law obeys the principle of superposition. The electric field obeys the principle of superposition. And since the electrostatic potential is just obtained by doing a line integral of the electric field, the electrostatic potential obeys the principle of superposition. So the total poten potential at V, at point P, V is just V sub one plus V sub two. I just have to do these problems separately, one at a time, and add results up. I know what the electrostatic potential due to Q1 is, just derived it. This is Q sub one divided by four pi epsilon naught R. Remember, electrostatic potentials, sometimes people just call these potentials and get rid of the word electrostatic. So the potential or the electrostatic potential goes like one over R. So I need some geometry in this problem. So R, is simply going to be the square root of z squared plus d squared divided by four. So I have an expression for the electrostatic potential of Q1 at my point P in terms of the geometry of the problem. In the denominator, I have z squared plus d squared over four, all raised to the one half power. And again, I picked the problem, I selected a problem where Q1 is in fact just the charge Q. So that's one half of the problem. If you think about it, I can easily write down an expression for Q2. And it is the same. Namely, R for Q1 is identical to R for Q2, so the denominator doesn't change. And as I said before, I picked a problem where Q1 and Q2 are identical charges. So Q2 is just Q divided by four pi epsilon naught times the square root of Z squared plus D squared over four.
So the principle of superposition tells me that the total electrostatic potential at point P is just obtained by adding these two creatures together. And I can do that and I will get 2Q over 4 pi epsilon naught times a geometric factor, z squared plus d squared over 4, all to the 1 half power in the denominator. Now, as a bonus, if I want to find the electric field at point P, all I have to do is take minus the gradient of this. And I know what the gradient operator is in this problem. I'm just doing this in Cartesian coordinates. And so I leave it up to you to do the calculus. And you should find something that you already know to be true. That in fact, once I take the gradient of the electrostatic potential and multiply that by a minus sign, I will find that the electric field is k hat 2qz. All those are in the numerator. Denominator, I must have my ubiquitous factor of 4 pi epsilon naught. And I have my ge geometric factor of z squared plus d squared over 4 raised to the 1 half power. And we did this problem before. But the key thing is, it's much easier to do this problem by calculating the electrostatic potential. And then when you're finished, take the gradient of that expression, multiply it by minus one, and that'll give you the electric field. So go back and look at our derivation where we actually looked at this problem where we actually calculated the electric field. We worried about vectors and what directions they went and orientation. You don't have to do all that. The electrostatic potential formalism allows you to calculate electric field without having to worry about vectors until the very end. That's why it's useful. Okay. And again, please check all this. So the prescription is we're going to pick problems we already know how to do, but go back and redo them using the idea of the electrostatic potential, and we'll show that it's a much easier way to deal with things. Second example, let's consider a finite wire of linear charge density lambda. Does that sound familiar? It should. We have done this problem before. So let me just draw in everything you'll need. And we'll get started. So I'm going to have a a wire whose geometry I'm going to ignore. So it's, in, it's thin. It's fun. I'm going to ignore its width. And it has a linear charge density of lambda. And I want to calculate the electrostatic potential at point P. So I'm going to need, again, my unit vectors to tell me what I'm doing. This is a right angle. Here is a differential piece of charge, small piece of charge, dq. Here's an angle theta. Here's a distance z. And I will call this distance from the origin to the differential charge, dq, x. So what is the problem here? that we want to solve. We want to find, in this problem, the electrostatic potential 
at point P. That's the problem we want to solve. And we're going to do it by recognizing that we start from our definition of the electrostatic potential. But in this case, I don't have a discrete number of charges. I don't have a single point charge or two point charges. I have a charge distribution. So that means I'm going to have to sum up contributions of the electrostatic potential over the object, which in this case is just the wire. It's just a line integral. So this is going to be dq divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r. No unit vectors, no r hats, okay? No vectors r. This problem is simply one of solving this integral and that you, without the headaches of looking at vectors. Okay, so let's make some progress. dq, of course, is the, is the product of the linear charge density lambda times dx. And in the denominator, I have 4 pi epsilon naught r. What is r? If I look at this problem geometrically, it's just the square root of x squared plus z squared all to the one half power. So I have to do an integral from minus L to L. My wire has length 2L. DX is in the numerator and in the denominator. I have 4 pi epsilon naught X squared plus Z squared to the one half power. And that's all I have to do. I just have to be able to evaluate this integral. I don't have to worry about vectors and their components. Okay, life is easy. Well, it's relatively easy. Now, does this integral look familiar to you? It should. So the problem is all the physics is over. It's just a problem in calculus. This is an integral that we have done before. We've done this several times before. So the electrostatic potential is gonna be lambda over four pi epsilon naught. And in the numerator, I'm going to have the limits of integration go from minus L to L. I'm going to have a dx over x squared plus z squared to the one half power. I will give you a hint of how to do this problem. We will use trigonometric substitution, a time honored trick that's worked many, many times before. Save this and lots of problem set uh, examples. We will set the tangent of theta equal to x over z. We'll remember x is a variable in this problem, but z is a constant. So this integral is something that's very easy to do. It's an integral over a single variable. X, therefore, is going to be equal to Z times the tangent of theta. DX is going to be Z times the secant squared of theta, D theta. Excuse me. And X squared plus Z squared to the one-half power. I'm going to simplify that by just factoring out a Z. So I'll get 1 plus X over Z squared the entire quantity to the one half power, and that's going to be z times the secant of theta, since one plus the tangent of theta squared is the secant squared of theta squared, and then you take the square root of it. 
So we're, we've seen this, seen this movie before. So the electrostatic potential simply reduces to lambda over four pi epsilon naught. Lambda is a linear charge density. Epsilon naught is a permittivity of free space. And I have to do an integral that I've seen before. Simply right. And my final answer is going to be that, lambda, that the electrostatic potential is lambda over four pi epsilon naught times the natural log of L squared plus Z squared to the one half power plus L in the numerator. Denominator, I have L squared plus Z squared to the one half power minus L. So I leave it up to you to show that this is true. Because after all, one of the goals and problems that three was to do a pretty extensive review of all the integrals we'll need in this course. So that now when we have to actually apply them, we don't have to do them explicitly. We've done that work. So you need to check this. And again, if you need a refresher, mini course, go back to problem set three. Okay, what do we want? We want at the end of the day, the electric field. That's just minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. And again, I'm gonna leave that for you to do. And that's gonna be two lambda L in the numerator. Denominator is gonna be four pi epsilon naught Z times L squared plus Z squared to the one half power. So let's sort of check this thing dimensionally. Let's see, L is a length, Z is a length, they both cancel. The square root of a length is just a length there. I have a linear charge density, it goes like charge over length. So this thing over here on the right hand side has to go like one over a length squared, which is right because that's what the electric field should go like. And again, you need to show that this is true. And in fact, I'll leave this to you to do in problem set eight. So the beauty of all of this is that you can get the expression for the electric field due to a finite wire of 2L at a distance Z from the midpoint of that wire. That wire has linear charge density lambda. And you can get that answer much faster using the idea of electrostatic potential than by just doing the integral formally as we did a couple of lectures ago and problem sets ago uh, by writing down the electric field, breaking it up as a vector, breaking up into its components. So the electrostatic potential allows you to calculate electric fields um, in a much easier manner because electrostatic potential is a scalar. Electro, uh, the electro, electric field is a vector. Vectors are always more complicated and difficult or more difficult than scalars. The hard part we leave to the end, namely once we have the electrostatic potential, all we have to do is take its gradient, but I offer the following comment. Differentiation is always easier than integration. Okay, so it's much easier to get a final result and take its derivative rather than worrying about complex integrals from the beginning. Okay, let's go through another example. In this case, I'll just draw it first. So I'm gonna have a spherical shell and it's gonna have a radius A and it has some surface charge density sigma. So if you're counting, this is really example three. Example one was an isolated single point charge at the origin. Example, uh, um, maybe it was, let's see, yeah. And example two was uh, the case of two point charges 
example three was a line chart. So this is actually example four, sorry. So, there'll be some distance P that I want to calculate the electrostatic potential at. And let me get the definition of the surface charge density out the way. We all know what that is. R will be a vector that goes from infinity into the center of the sphere. So what's the problem? So this is a spherical shell. of radius A. So let's turn this into a sentence. For a spherical shell radius A, find the electric static potential where the reference point is again at infinity. This idea of setting the reference point for the electrostatic potential at infinity probably works for most problems that we're going to talk about. No, we're going to talk about. Uh, we'll see some examples perhaps later where that's not the case. But first things first. OK, so there are two regimes. R could be greater than A, the radius of the sphere, and R can be less than A. So we want to break this problem up into two parts. So let's do this case first. So we're going to exploit something that we've already talked about, Gauss's law. If you apply Gauss's law to this problem, then it's easy to show that for distances r greater than a, the electric field is simply q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught times r hat divided by r. So why is this useful? It's useful because now we can write down the expression for the electrostatic potential. We know what the electric field is for the case where R is greater than A. We, in principle, know how to take this dot product. And all we have to do is evaluate this line integral or path integral from some lower limit to upper, an upper limit. And that'll get us, give us the electrostatic potential. V again for the case where R is greater than A. Okay, so let's, let's just start. So the electrostatic potential V is minus E dot dr. I know that for distances greater than A, the electric field, according to Gauss's law, is just Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught. Now I'm going to be very careful here. I don't want to confuse my coordinates in the integrand, or the variables in the integrand, with the limits of integration. So I'm going to prime all the variables of integration. Well, that's a new word. So prime coordinates are needed to distinguish from the 
limits of integration. And we'll see exactly how this works out in a minute. Well, first things first, r hat prime dotted into dr prime, <coughs> excuse me, that's easy. I already did that in the previous problem. Let's pull out the four pi epsilon naught. There's my minus sign. So this is just q dr prime divided by r prime squared. So what are the limits of integration? Well, again, I'm doing this problem for distances outside the spherical shell. So I have to go from minus infinity, I'm using that as my point of reference, to a point r. And now you can see why this r is the same thing as this r, but I don't want to confuse that with this guy because that's not the same thing. That's a variable of integration. So this is a variable of integration. That's a variable of integration. This is a limit of integration. Okay, and you may say I'm being fussy, but no, you know, it's this keeping things straight that's gonna help you. Okay, the integral is an elementary integral to evaluate. There's a four pi epsilon naught in the denominator outside. There's a Q over R. We know exactly what that R is. That's this guy. And then we have the electrostatic potential at infinity, but we set that equal to zero. So when we finished the electrostatic potential of my spherical shell for distances outside the radius of the shell is simply that. And that's not a surprise. That's the same as what you would get for a point charge. And we've done that before. Okay, so we have to complete the other part of the problem. Namely, we have to look at what's going on inside the sphere. For distances r less than a, what is the electrostatic potential? So we have to be very careful. Again, it's minus e dotted into dr, or really minus the line integral e dotted into dr prime, because I don't want to confuse the, vari the um, variables I'm integrating over with, the variables I'm integrating over with the limits of integration. And again, I can do this problem, like the previous problem. I'll get a Q over R prime dr. But the limits of integration, I have to be very careful and break them up into two parts. One part goes from infinity to A, and the other part is going to go from A to some distance R. So infinity to A, a to R, but R is less than A. Gauss's law tells you the electric field inside the spherical shell is zero. So there's not gonna be a contribution in that second term. There's no E field inside the sphere. So all I'm left with is an expression that you can evaluate. It's an elementary integral. It's one over four pi epsilon naught, Q over A, where again, I'm gonna give you the impression I've slid past this, 
but I've defined the reference point so that the electrostatic potential vanishes when R is infinity. So writing down this expression implies that I've taken care of this limit of integration and the way I've done it is by insisting that the electrostatic potential advantage will vanish when R is very, very, very far away from the charge distribution or infinity. You can't get further away than that. Okay. So, You can look at this thing to make sure it makes sense. Again, A is a distance. So this thing on the right-hand side is gonna go like one over R. The electrostatic potential should go like one over R. And note this is, this is a constant. Since A is a constant, A is simply the radius of the sphere is fixed. So let's summarize our answer. So we've looked at so this is summary for case. Uh, spherical shell, uh, it's a charged spherical cell shell. Of uh, radius A. So we have two cases, two regimes to worry about. If you're outside the spherical shell, we've determined that the electrostatic potential is that of a single isolated point charge. Now we went through all this business because if we want to calculate the electric field, all we have to do is take minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential. You can do that just as well as I can. And you'll get an expression that is very familiar just the electrostatic potential of a point charge. The spherical shell that has some surface charge since a sigma on it, where sigma is Q divided by the area of the shell or by A squared, behaves exactly as if all that charge were concentrated at the origin so that you have Q at the origin. So this is okay. This makes sense physically. And in the other regime, inside the sphere, we've discovered that the electrostatic potential is a constant. It's Q over four pi epsilon naught A. So if you calculate the gradient of the electrostatic potential in this region and multiply it by minus one, you'll get zero. So this is quite interesting. Just because the electrostatic or the electric field is zero in a region of space, doesn't mean that the electrostatic potential has to be zero in that same region of space. This does not vanish. Okay. And again, this follows from the fact that if you have a constant and you take its gradient, of course you'll get zero. So again, this is a problem that you can solve by calculating the electrostatic potential first. It's easier to do. There are no vector components to worry about. The integration is actually easier to do because you don't have to do integrals involving terms like this anymore. 
because you don't even see this thing anymore. The position vector r divided by r cubed, and we would get uh, things that went like three half uh, as so a quantity to the three halves in the denominator. You don't have to, and in the numerator you have i hat times a component times plus j hat times a component plus k hat times a component. We don't have to go down that road. Okay, calculate the introduction of the idea of electrostatic potential allows you to avoid all that traffic. All you have to simply do is do an integral, solve a scalar problem, and at the end, take the electric fields or calculate the electric fields by just differentiating. Differentiation is much easier than integration. Scalars are easier to do than vectors. Okay, so for my final example today, I'm gonna to redo this problem. And I'm gonna do it a different way. So when we go back to the case of a spherical charged shell of radius A. Okay. So I don't mind drawing this picture again. So there's my spherical shell. The shell will have an origin. Put the origin a little bit over here. So I'm gonna need a coordinate system. So my unit vectors, i hat, j hat, k hat. That looks a little funny, that's an i hat. Okay, here's my spherical shell. And it's going to have a radius of a. And that vector is going to point to a differential surface element, which again, I'm going to prime. So I'm going to prime all the coordinates. So prime, here the convention I'm going to use is that prime coordinates refer to the charge distribution. I'm going to do that simply so that I don't get mixed up when I solve the problem. I don't get my variables mixed, mixed up. As we'll see in a minute. Okay, so the problem at hand is I want to calculate the electrostatic potential at some point, which I'll call P. That point is a distance Z from the origin and the vector, well, I'll say vector, I'll say vector, the vector from ds prime to p is r. And sigma, of course, is my surface charge density. And what I wanna do is find, yeah, what do I wanna do? I wanna find the electrostatic potential but in this case, I'm gonna find it everywhere. This is exactly the same problem we did before. So we'll find V everywhere. Okay, so the way we're going to do this is by just writing down the definition of the electrostatic potential, not for an isolated single point charge, or not for a collection of point charges, but for a charge distribution. So that means that we're going to have to do an integral over dq of four pi epsilon naught. No r hats, no i hats, no j hats, no k hats. We're going to 
Okay. And this is a, going to be a surface integral. So we're going to need a couple of things. First thing we're going to need to know is what is dq? Well, that's a diff, that's a small piece of charge. It's going to be equal to a surface charge density sigma times the diff, differential surface element ds prime. Okay. Second thing we're going to need to know is what is ds prime? What is the differential surface element in spherical polar coordinates? We know this. It's r squared sine theta d theta d phi. R is A in this problem, it's a constant, so it's A squared. And again, I'm gonna prime all the variables that relate to a charge distribution. So theta, <coughs> excuse me, and phi are primed. So again, to do this integral, I need dq. Items one and two tell me what that is. I certainly don't have to know what R is. And then once I have all those three pieces of information, I can plug them into this integral and do the surface integral. And again, I don't have to worry about vectors and the components. Now, let's go back to the figure and see what's going on. There is an angle in spherical polar coordinates. It is the polar angle, that's theta. And again, it's going to be primed. And if you look at this problem, Z may be fixed, but R is always going to be changing. It's going to be moving around as you do the interval. And A will have a fixed uh, distance, fixed magnitude, but it's going to be moving. So this triangle that's formed is not going to be a right triangle. So we can't use the Pythagorean theorem like we did in previous examples to bail ourselves out to figure out what r is. I mean, you cannot say that r is equal to the square root of z squared plus a squared. That's the, that's the key message here. This is not true. And if you don't believe that in this problem, think about it. That's not what's happening there. So you're going to need to find some way to relate r to z and a. And you can do that using something we've seen already from vector calculus. The law of course, a law of cosines will come to our rescue. So from that figure, you can say that r squared is z squared plus a squared minus two a z cosine theta prime. Or that r is just z squared plus a squared minus two a z cosine of theta prime quantity in brackets all goes to one half power. So I now know what r is. So I have everything that I need to do to formally do this integral. The electrostatic potential is going to involve sigma over four pi epsilon naught. I'll pull that out. I have a surface integral to do. I have a ds prime in the numerator, and that's just a squared sine of theta prime d theta prime, d phi prime, and the denominator, I have z squared plus a squared minus 2az cosine of theta prime, all that to the one half power. So this is an integral I need to evaluate. I'll do it in two parts. The first part is I'll do the easy part first. 
this is a two-dimensional integral. I'm integrating over two variables, theta prime and phi prime. Well, phi prime is not contained in the argument of the uh, numerator of the integrand, nor is it contained in the denominator. So it makes sense to me to integrate over the azimuthal angle first, phi prime. And then once I get a result, integrate over the polar angle, theta prime. And so I'll do that. So I've used the law of cosine. So I don't need her anymore. I'll just get rid of it. Okay. So this will simplify to V, the electrostatic potential, is just going to be equal to sigma R squared over 2, be a little bit less sloppy, sigma A squared divided by 2, epsilon naught, and then I just have to integrate from zero to pi. I'm integrating over the uh, polar angle, d theta prime sine of theta prime, and in the numerator, the denominator has z squared plus a squared minus 2az cosine theta to one half. So this is not a problem of physics anymore. This is a problem of calculus. OK, this integral looks horrendous until you step back and look at it and ask yourself, what are you trying to do? So what's constant in this problem? Well, A is constant, it's just the radius of this uh, spherical shell, and Z is constant, it's fixed. It's the point at which you want to evaluate the electrostatic potential. The only variable is, in this problem is clear from what we've written, it's just theta prime. So I'm going to do this integral by substitution. I'm going to set U equal to Z squared plus A squared minus 2AZ cosine of theta prime, sorry. DU can be simply written, since Z and A are constants, DU is just going to be a positive 2AZ sine theta prime, D theta prime. So my electrostatic potential is just going to be sigma A squared over two epsilon naught. I'm not going to change the variables of, I'm not going to do a change of variables for the limits of integration right here. I'm just going to leave it out here. And I'm going to have a one over two a z du over u to the one half power. Okay, that is a very elementary integral to do. I'm going to leave you to do this, and this will be actually part of problem set eight. So you will find that the electrostatic potential V is just sigma, the surface charge density times the radius of the shell divided by epsilon naught two, and Z, which is finds the point at which you want to find the electrostatic potential. And this is going to be z plus a quantity squared, all to the one half power, minus z minus a squared, quantity to the one half power. And I need a 
square bracket there. So I will ask you to prove this. And this will be in problem set eight. Okay, so I need to evaluate this thing. But I have square roots here, so I have to be careful. In other words, I want to find this answer for a value z less than, greater than a outside the shell and inside. But I have to be very careful how I do this. This answer involves a square root. So let me remind you that when you take the square root of a squared, it's not just a. It has the option of having a plus or minus sign. That's mathematically true, but there are many times when the negative value is not physical. So you don't use it. You don't get rid of it. You will get rid of it. And that's what we're going to do here. I have two terms. I have a z plus a squared, and I'm going to take the square root of that. And I'm going to take the positive square root. So that's OK. So I'm going to let the electrostatic potential always be a positive thing. So I'm just going to choose. for this term, a positive square root. Okay, so that'll take care of this guy. Now this guy is gonna be a little bit more interesting or challenging. So what am I talking about? Well, z minus a squared to the one half power, if I take the positive square root of this, I'll just get z minus a. So when I plug this back in to my expression for the electrostatic potential, I will get an answer that strictly speaking is only valid for the case where z is greater than a, where I'm outside the spherical shell. How about what's going on inside the spherical shell? Well, if I still want to insist that my uh, assumption is that in order to do this problem, I want to take the positive square root only, then I can rewrite this is simply this, that makes perfect sense. And then just taking the positive square root only is going to imply that this term has to be equal to that for the case where z is less than I'm walking down the road and there's a fork in the road. One case z is greater than a, in which case this term in my answer, if I take the positive square root, it simply becomes z minus a, and then this term this term has to become a minus z. So I am going to leave to you the exercise of completing this problem in problem set eight. There are a couple of steps. I want you to find exact expressions
for the electrostatic potential for the case where Z is greater than or equal to A. Do the same for the case where Z, find the electrostatic potential where Z is less than or equal to A. And finally, I want you to find the electric field everywhere. And you can do that by recognizing the definition of the electrostatic potential and how it's related to the electric field. The electrostatic potential is V. If you take minus the gradient of that, you will get the electric field, okay? So it was easier doing this problem in the previous way where we did Gauss's law. If you try to do this problem directly, namely by doing this in vector form, you're going to have much, much more work. So the bottom line is the electrostatic potential allows you the ability to calculate electric fields uh, using much less work because you don't have to write down vectors and the components. Scalars are much easier to deal with than vectors. Okay, so that concludes today's lecture, lecture eight. And we'll start the recitation section. So if there are any questions, um, comments on homework problems, problem sets, concepts, lectures, um, let's go for it. Okay, thanks very much.